welcome to the first episode of Zavi's Video Rewind, a brand new podcast from Zavi, the home of pop culture. I'm your host, Emily Murray, and together we'll be digging into our video archives, discussing a wide range of cult classics, all of which have recently received, or will be receiving, a new release on disc. Each week I will be joined by a guest to discuss a movie and the importance of film restoration. And for this very first episode, we have an absolute doozy to chat about. None other than Park Chan Wook's 2003 thriller, Old Boy, a cult classic that is regarded as being one of the best new noir films of all time, which received a new 4K release from Ario Video earlier this year. Based on a Japanese manga of the same name, the film follows a man named Odesu as he's released after 15 years of imprisonment, then embarking on a quest for vengeance against his unknown captor. Film journalist Tom Beasley joins me to discuss this twisted tale. How's it going, Tom? I thought you were calling me an absolute doozy to begin with. I was getting very excited. <laughs> I mean, you are as well, to be fair. We have a great guest and we have a doozy for movie to talk about. But how are you today? Obviously excited I, since I thought I called you a doozy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I was excited, followed by an immediate uh, period of sadness when I realised you were talking about the brilliant film it rather brilliant than me. Film. <laughs> Yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought Old Boy, I thought we'd start out like particularly strong because it is, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think it's a modern masterpiece. Yeah, I don't think there's any any question of that. I think every time I watch it, I find new levels of appreciation for it. I think I've seen it probably four or five times now. Oh, really? It, it, I think when you first see it, it feels like the kind of film that maybe wouldn't work as well on a second watch. But mm. the more I watch it over and over again, the, the richer it gets and the... the the weirder I think it gets oh, yeah. and every time it gets weirder it becomes more entertaining and so I I just love it I really do yeah I love it too it's interesting that you said you wouldn't know how it'd work in a rewatch because I I think I saw it for the first time a couple of years ago at university just because everyone was like you have to watch Old Boy, especially... Yeah. Old Boy is a film everyone sees for the first time at university, I think. It is, it is. And, <laughs> um, and then, so I only watched it for the second time at the weekend with my, uh, got my, uh, got my box set. Very good. <laughs> and um, so I watched it and yeah, it. I think I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it the first time, but I enjoyed it even more the second time. It's what you said. There's just so many layers to dive into. And then what was interesting was there was stuff I was reading about after in preparation for this and I was like my I was like really annoyed that a my brain wasn't clever enough to pick up on it the first time but b also (laughs) also astounded at how like clever it is um Mm. it's interesting because like I didn't really know much about it on my first watch and my initial impressions were like this is like a majorly messed up b very exciting and c like really it's a really unique film in the sense of it's like it's dark it's funny but it's you know there's also romance there I mean weird romance but you know (laughs) there's there's still like love there and it's a real interesting blend of tone and genre that I don't think I've ever really seen before yeah I think all of that's true and I think it's such a difficult film to pin down in terms of genre because it is I think it's described as like a neo-noir thriller and it is that but it has so many, you know, horror film elements, like you said, twisted romance elements. And yeah. The thing that struck me this time is how funny it is. It's a really funny movie. And, yeah. and you know, you sort of think of, of of kind of like Korean films, like Bong Joon-ho's films and the, the comedy in those. And uh, yeah, that sort of stuff really comes through in, in, in Old Boy. Yeah, like it's a sort of like black humour, like really dark mm. humour, but it just... It just works, uh, you know, so well. And talking off um, how I said the film's a lot cleverer than even I thought it was upon reading it, I was so annoyed at myself because uh, I did English at university and one of the you know, books I studied was Sophocles' Oedipus the King. And so when, yes. when I read that Park Chan work was partly <laughs> inspired by Oedipus, I was like, how did my brain, consider I'm so familiar with Oedipus the King as well, like not click? Because it's even obvious, like Odesu, Oedipus, like they're kind of similar yeah. names. And, and for those who don't know the story of Oedipus, you know, he like unwittingly fulfills a prophecy, which is to murder his father and marry his mother. And obviously, um, Odesu in this film he I, well he doesn't murder his wife but he's like portrayed as like he's framed for her murder isn't he and obviously he you know, falls in love with his daughter and whilst Oedipus gouges his eyes out Odesu cuts his tongue off so it's really like similar and it's interesting because like first when I was reading about the connection like I was like that's weird and then it clicked and 
I think it really fits into this sort of operatic nature of old boy like it's an extreme tale and it's told in this really grandiose way I think that works really well for the story yeah it absolutely does and it is big and it's epic and it's dark and it's twisted and it's warped and it's just all of these things coming together and and as you said you know the 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 literary elements of it yeah. do come through and i think it's interesting that it has what in some ways could be considered quite a sort of i don't know exploitation movie kind of midnight yeah. movie kind of premise but the execution is so big and operatic and kind of almost prestige that yeah. it and i think that's maybe why it kind of breaks out of the sort of i don't know extreme cinema dungeon where a lot of films of its ilk end up because obviously old boy whichever definition of extreme you use it is an extreme film um but it, it kind of gets given a, a sort of veneer of quality and a veneer mm. of uh academic discussion i guess that many sort of similarly extreme especially extreme asian films don't necessarily get yeah it's interesting how this one in particular sort of worked its way into western culture obviously we had that american remake less than about that the better but um <laughs> but yeah but this one like it's interesting because i know it's part of this vengeance trilogy that he did and like it's on me that i haven't seen the other two yet they are my watch list but again it's like even that it's even the old boys part of his trilogy this is the one that really stands out and it's what you said it's the sort of operatic way you know the story is told and it is extreme but i feel that it's a really interesting blend of like the real like it feels real to me um I don't know what you think about that, but I, I just, even though the story is obviously unbelievable, like there's a sort of grim reality to it as well. Well, the way it sits as a revenge movie, I think is really interesting because you have this whole, the, the mystery, I guess, that's established, you know, the, the two central questions, who was it that imprisoned him and why? Yeah. And that's sort of set up as the driving force of, of Odesu throughout the movie. And then he finds out, he works it all out and, and, and he's, understood it all and then there's a moment where he effectively can choose to walk away like his curiosity has been satisfied he can choose to walk away and i think yeah. the line is something like vengeance is a part of me now and it's at that point that you realize he's kind of always been driven by revenge rather than answers um which i think is a, a really interesting uh, character uh, yeah. maneuver because you know it's by seeking that revenge that he digs himself the hole that he ultimately ends up in um, yeah. once the true extent of everything becomes clear. So I think that's really fascinating. The idea of it as a revenge movie where almost the character doesn't quite know what they're looking for. They think they're looking for the answers, but then they get the answers and they're still not satisfied. Yeah, And so they have to take it um, a step further. And I think there is something real about that even amongst the sort of the flamboyance of the the storytelling mm. there is something real about initially that quest for answers you know there's the several brilliant scenes where he effectively squares off against the person responsible and has an opportunity to kill them but they very you know swaggeringly say well if you kill me now you'll never get to know yeah. why yeah and and that's really fascinating that this on the one hand he feels this visceral hatred towards the person who imprisoned him for 15 years but on the other hand, he just really wants to know why and really wants to know the answers. And I think that's a very real um, mm. and, and very human motivating factor. Yeah, I was about to say that it's very human. Like, I think what we we connect to Odesu in a way because of that. It's not it's not the violent revenge that he wants. We connect to him because also we too would want to know why have I been imprisoned and tortured for, you know, 15 years? And it's interesting as well that obviously Odesu is not the only one looking for revenge because... Wu Jin's also looking for revenge like he's trying to have his revenge on what happened to his sister and so, you know, it's not just a story of one man's search for vengeance it's it's two and they both approach it in they're both violent but it's, it's still very very different ways um, yeah, certainly one's more <laughs> elaborate than the other <laughs> yeah I mean yeah what do you think of the sort of reveal at the end I mean let's be honest no one saw it coming unless you've read no. the manga although I don't know actually how similar it is to the Japanese manga it's based on but I like I I don't know why, but I somehow managed to avoid the spoiler that it's his daughter. So I like my jaw dropped, and even when I still know what the answer is, and you know the, the big reveal, like I still it's such a jaw dropping moment. 
I think that's it. I think because it's such an enormous reveal, it's mm. so massive and so huge that even when you watch it again, it, it still feels big because it's still such a such a weighty moment. And one of the things I noticed this time is, you know, you watch the sex scenes between Mido and, and, and Odei Sue, and even before you know, there's something off about those sex scenes. Yeah. Even before you know why there's something off about them. And I think they're obviously framed and written and acted in such a way that they're not supposed to feel like... Because, you know, sometimes you'll see a sex scene in a movie which is two characters who've been, I don't know, wanting it for a long time and it feels almost cathartic and yeah. and romantic. But these scenes never feel like that. They always feel wrong and yeah. somehow questionable. And then obviously later we learn why they feel so wrong. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was really fascinating and that's something I picked up on this time. Um, but that that reveal is is incredible. It's so it's it's just so absurd. Yeah, um, exactly. You know, the, the the scheme for revenge is so elaborate, <laughs> and it is so big and operatic. It's all revealed in that ridiculous penthouse with mm. the tiny little pools. And I and love the, that. And the place. shower. Why is his shower like just in a <laughs> cube in the middle of this big apartment? Like, even if I was the wealthiest man on the planet, I would at least have a private shower that's not like. <laughs> that exposed <laughs> it's just bizarre yeah, that must be that must be like that must be a set they can't have found that apartment <laughs> God, that's the one like they... that's the one <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I was going to ask you is one of my favorite. Obviously, one of my favorite scenes is the big reveal, and I think that's where you, Yu Ji Tae, who plays Lee Woo Jin, you know, he like I think that's his big acting move because obviously Choi Min Sik, who plays Odesu, like he's outstanding, but I think like Woo Jin's like I don't know, like he's like this sort of charismatic, mysterious villain. But when he reveals what's really going on, like he completely unhinges, and it's such a performance just in that singular moment. Yeah, there's some great stuff in that sort of final confrontation. There's because there's lots of like really weird shot choices. Like there's that really yeah. really odd split diopter where he's at the front and and Ode Sue's at the back. Um, oh, and yeah. When they reveal a lot of the story, and yeah, that's just an absurd choice that somehow works. <laughs> and then obviously you get the whole thing with Ode Sue where he's on his knees and he's begging and he's pretending to be a dog and then he cuts his yeah. tongue out and <laughs> almost all of that time we're not seeing uh, Wu Jin react really yeah. to that we're seeing it entirely you know ground level and yeah Choi Min Sik just he gets to do everything in this movie oh yeah like he gets, everything he gets to do yeah he gets subtler moments he gets obviously some of the hugest bits of acting you've ever seen <laughs> and, but it's really fascinating because when you first meet Odesu at the very beginning mm. he is a pretty pathetic drunken idiot oh yeah like you know? it's interesting because I think in another with another actor you could have maybe easily been really frustrated by him because when you first yes. presented with him he's instantly unlikable and obviously he goes on to do very bad things uh, like I don't think you're meant to like him but I feel that no. he could have been maybe so annoying we didn't empathise with him but you know, he plays it he plays it perfectly it's what you said he like he's a loser he's a drunken fool he's a lover he's a vigilante he's like an action kind of hero like he's a beaten man he's literally everything under the sun in this film and you know it's such a rounded performance i think that's what makes the character feel real to me absolutely and the all of the elements of it are so good like the the bits the segments where he's like this sort of laconic Clint Eastwood-esque vigilante yeah. are just so good. Like the the, the very famous corridor scene, oh, the yes. single shot. Like in that scene, you are rooting for him as he, you know, hits people really hard in the head with hammers and <laughs> um, you know, grabs whatever bit of improvised weaponry he can find to to take people down. And I think you are supposed to be with him there, but obviously, mm. as you say, at times he's very deliberately framed as unlikable. Um, yeah. and goes on to do pretty awful things and um, you know certainly by the end there's something almost pathetic about the way he kind of just the way he tries to wriggle out of it yeah yeah and what do you think of me do as well I think she's it's what you said earlier actually about how there's something off there's something off about how she's just so willing to take him in um and like because but you know there's a sort of slight chaos to it and she's wide-eyed she's clearly curious but I always think she's such an interesting puzzle to solve from the start like she's just yet another mystery and he often asks you know can she be trusted and we're also asking that like why is she suddenly just taking this 
like bad man in basically like it you it, it it's bizarre and i think i think she's just such an interesting character as well yeah she's very strange and um certainly it's hard to get a handle on her and and, and the way she acts because obviously yeah she takes this guy in um effectively from off the street but i guess as we learn there is they are being drawn together and it's not really something they can help yeah. um, and so there is a tragedy to me though like they have obviously the very weird exchange early on where they're talking about ants and how yeah. ants have a colony and so they can't be lonely and there's the really surreal sequence of the ant on the subway yeah yeah um which yeah i think peyton reed and marvel would be very uh, pleased <laughs> with the pleased with that scene um but yeah i love that stuff and so there is a kind of tragedy to her mm. that you sense that she just as well as all the programming obviously she just gravitates towards the first person who kind of shows an interest in her yeah. um, because she has been so lonely for so long obviously as a part of wujin's plan really to to make her this person who will you know gravitate towards uh ode su um for all of his problems which he clearly has throughout the movie um so I think she's an interesting character. I think um, I think the performance is 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 really well uh, modulated and allows it to get away with the fact that by necessity of the storytelling, she's not particularly rounded as a person. Yeah. Um, and I guess yeah, that's one of the things that um, that you could criticize the film for. But I think the way that the story is told um, means that she works as a character and she yeah, works yeah. as a as as an opposite number to to Ode Su and perversely the, you are sort of rooting for them you, yeah you are like <laughs> and, until the end but even at the end like like how do you feel about the reveal at the end when obviously he goes to the hypnotist and he you know, he wants to forget everything and he's reunited with her like i like i like that kind of makes me happy that they still have each other like even though it's like obviously it's completely wrong like is what you said i feel like in a perverse way you are kind of like you still want him to probably not be i want them to be sort of friends <laughs> obviously not romantically involved <laughs> but I, but they clearly you know they clearly bond definitely and and there is something to that like and that's why i think there's, there's a sort of kind of pathetic feel to, to ode sue at the end because mm. that final image of his face it doesn't really seem like he's forgotten yeah you yeah know, it's it's it, it's sort of implied that the hypnotist might not even have been there at all um and that he's just sort of trying to convince himself uh but yeah, I think it's a part of the genius of, of the way Park Chan Wook tells this story is mm. that you do sort of want it to work out for them, even yeah. though everything about what they're doing is awful and wrong and terrible. The the kind of operatic storytelling, and I think so much of what the film does is to try and I guess convince like trick your mind that it's a sort of normal romantic revenge story <laughs> when actually it has all of these crazy elements in that are stuff you wouldn't expect in kind of any other movie and so there is a way that that he sort of tries to trick you at the end into rooting for them yeah even though their relationship is awful <laughs> yeah and very very wrong like i still i know personally i still want them to be together just not in a romantic way just in a friend way because it, it's like they kind of do need each other like do they have anyone else no like and that's sad it's what you said it's a tragedy like another genre that this film explores like tragedy um talking about you know crazy elements like i always forget how weird this film is visually like there's just mm. certain quirks like what you said with the ant and one of my favorite moments is we'll talk about the corridor scene later because obviously we have to talk about the corridor yes. scene <laughs> but there's a great moment where he has the hammer and it like tracks his trajectory towards the guy's head yes. with a red line and it's just random but it just works and i think there's something with clocks as well you did know, a clock sort of a weird like transition scenes and i think like it's quite unique how it is visually and inventive but i think that fits the story yeah i think it's like there's that's where you feel the manga influence i think yeah is in in those sort of bits of stylistic trickery you can see that it is you know ripped from the pages of something akin to a comic book the way that they uh the way that they do that and yeah it's really fascinating and, and it means that you're constantly caught off guard. You really never know where the film's going to go visually because you have weird comic sequences. You have mm. surreal sequences like the ant. You have um, strange sepia-toned flashbacks where 
sometimes it's the young versions of the characters and sometimes it's the old ones yeah. and they're kind of merged together and then you have yeah weird stuff like the hammer trajectory and then you have stuff like the corridor fight which is just like you know virtuoso action movie stuff like mm. you know you watch something like the raid later uh, yeah, and oh, you go, one of my Gareth favorite e- films. Gareth Evans was Gareth Evans was obviously inspired yeah. by Old Boy when he was and uh, John both Wick. the Raid and the Raid, yeah, and the Raid yeah. too. And then John Wick, obviously steeped in uh, Asian action cinema. Yeah. So it, it's a really fascinating film visually. It, it means that you're constantly caught off guard. I think, given that you know that I mentioned earlier the sort of exploitation movie trappings of its sort of extreme storytelling, and so with that in mind, you're almost caught off guard when you see it's two hours long. Yeah. But then you watch it, and because it's so sweeping and so epic and so inventive and so strange, you kind of two hours isn't long enough. You want to be like another hour in this ridiculous world. Yeah, um, it fully absorbs you, I think, and it's such an interesting mix of the extreme and the grandiose, and also just sort of gritty realism. Like there's moments where I feel like I need to scrub my TV to get all the dirt off the screen because of yes. like this sort of disgusting world that they're in, and it's what you said. I think in terms of like inspired by the manga, like all these bright colors, but they aren't like inviting pretty colors. Like there's just a grubbiness to it, and it's interesting because considering how messed up it is and and horrible like story-wise like i would like to spend more time in this world which is i think is a testament to to the visuals and a sort of way that park chan works directed the story as well definitely i think you just want to yeah you want to spend time with these characters and spend time in this world you know it's almost wrong to say you're enjoying it but more yeah. than you're, you just you just sort of appreciate being immersed in it because it's such a well-built world it's like mm. almost completely unrecognizable from our own in the way it operates and, uh, and the way it works um you know certainly elements of it are very much akin to it being a 20 year old film you know the the internet cafes and all of that sort <laughs> yeah of strangeness and telephone directories and yeah all of that um and I guess that gives it, certainly watching it now, that gives it the kind of separation that that maybe allows you to position it a bit outside of your reality. Yeah. And maybe that makes some of its darker elements easier to kind of, uh, makes them go down easier. Yeah. And as I said, we have to talk about the corridor scene because it's one of my, it might not be my favourite moment, but it's one of my favourite moments in the film. But it's definitely what it's most famous for, just beautiful one shot. Um, which I, it wasn't intended to be one shot originally. Like I think they, when they originally storyboarded it, it was going to be more than one hundred. But then Chanwick was like, "Nah, no, nah, I've just thought it needs to be one shot," which I think is the smartest decision, the smartest decision this man's ever made. Because I don't know, but this action shot, like as soon as he drops a knife, and then the camera sort of starts rolling with his movement, and it's just one swift movement. It's just, it's just mesmerizing. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have all of these like. I guess it would have been easy, easy to do it as like a sort of sweeping, continuous tracking shot. But it's the way it stops with him and mm. the way it moves forward again and moves backward and changes direction. And it, it's, it's really smartly done. And uh, yeah, absolutely. So influential. Um, and I think one of the fascinating things is, so you me- we mentioned how everyone comes to this film at university. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people, certainly I was, came to it because that's the film with the really cool tracking shot fight scene in yeah yeah that's why i watched it and then i wasn't prepared for the chaos i was brought into you know i I wasn't told about all the incest and all of the you know squid eating and all of the weird sex and the Mm. ants on the subway and strange vengeance plotting i wasn't told about all of that it was yeah this is this film with the cool hammer scene in the very cool to get me through the door yeah yeah and then everything that came next was a surprise and a pretty crazy surprise at that (laughs) no i feel exactly the same way and it's what we said earlier like films like john wick and the raid and even like other big action hollywood films are inspired by this one action scene like there's obviously other action in there but this is the true stand-up moment but it's interesting because like unlike john wick for instance like odesu like he is struggling like through this action scene like he gets a knife in the back he's out of breath like he's exhausted like he has to lie down for for a time so it's interesting that i wouldn't call him like an action hero like he's just like a man filled with rage and this is all that rage coming out but it's interesting that all these other action heroes like john wick have been inspired by this character and that moment 
Yeah, it's really interesting as well because the film goes to great lengths to explain how he's where he is. Like, because he, we see him training, we see him, you know, shadow yeah. boxing and punching the wall. And after a while in his imprisonment, he just decides to turn himself into like a monster almost. And that obviously comes through in his his choice of moniker at times when he refers to himself as as monster. Yeah. Um, and so I love the fact that it, it explains why he's such a you know a talented fighter because it's what he's been doing for 15 years and so we get that scene early on where he tests it basically on those yeah. guys um and, and he just beats the heck out of them constantly um and, and so i like that it adds a level of um i guess a level of realism to it even though it is this crazy very yeah. cinematic fight scene and you know, you have to love the Asian cinema extremity of, of some of the violence. You know, there's the one scene where um, uh, where he gets thrown against the window at the very end uh, and he's thrown yeah. like 10 foot up the window. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's so <laughs> extravagant and ridiculous. But within the confines of this bonkers film, um, you totally go with it. And, and so you have to love uh, all of that stuff. You know, there's a reason that the most recognisable still of the film is him holding the hammer aloft. Yeah, and he's got like a sort like, of facial expression. I can't speak today. Facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, handy when you're doing a podcast. That is just yeah. like, I don't know, his his face at time, like he's just, you can tell he's just had enough, basically. Like, yes. Um, I think that's a, you know, he's, I don't know, but you just really do feel that this is a guy who's just been beaten and beaten to the ground mm. and it's just, full of rage and just needs to lash out and that's that's why it's what you said that's why his character is believable and it's what makes him quite a different character to anything else i think we've seen before on screen it's a different kind of rage yeah it's this notion of someone who's been captive for so long and had so many questions for so long that it's sort of drained the humanity out of him yeah like whatever he was before now he's a guy who systematically removes a whole mouthful of teeth from someone with the back end of a hammer like yeah. <laughs> he's he's barely human anymore um and, and so i think that's maybe that also accounts for part of the strangeness of their relationship that mm. she is as you said very wide-eyed and very sort of um i guess keen to explore the world whereas he is so hollowed out and, and so empty and so driven only by rage vengeance and mystery um that that makes their relationship strange as well as everything else that's going on that makes it strange yeah but i think i think it's it's really fascinating and it does sort of in a way kind of set him apart from um from other characters of this ilk uh, in in the way that all pans out yeah yeah i agree and why do you think it's had such an like, i suppose we spoke about the impact on action cinema but why do you think you know, as we spoke earlier about how this film, for some reasons, you know, well, for some reason, it's a masterpiece, but yeah, you know, it's really sort of come through to Western culture. But why do you think it has had such an impact? I think what it is is I think it's like it, it's that cult element of it. It is. It's exactly like we said. Everybody watches it at university yeah. because there will be some university film club <laughs> or some guy who's on your course who loves films, and he'll go, you know, because. <laughs> they won't want to recommend an obvious film. So they'll go, what's the, the best and not obvious film I could think of? <laughs> and Old Boy is kind of the one that became the recommendation. Yeah. And because it goes round in film circles so much, you know, the, the corridor fight is so acclaimed, you know, if people ask what's a film that's really going to mess me up, <laughs> you say Old Boy. If anyone is, you know, minded to explore world cinema, if they go, well, I haven't really watched anything with subtitles... It, it's almost accessible because it's sort of like a genre yeah. thing. Um, and, you know, you see a guy on the, you know, the cover or whatever with a hammer and you go, yeah, <laughs> I don't mind reading a couple of subtitles if, I, if that's what I'm going to get. <laughs> but, yeah, it's interesting because, like, one thing that I think I was told it was ultra violent, and it is, by the way, it is incredibly violent, but I don't think it was as violent as I expected. As Like, there was a lot more humanity in there that I first and not that I was let down by that because I have a bit of a sensitive, <laughs> I have a bit of a sensitive stomach when it comes to violence but um, you know, there's only like really like a few key scenes they are some of the most memorable yeah. ones like the corridor scene the teeth scene but it's not I wouldn't say it's like super super violent like it was definitely a lot more human than I expected yeah and that's the thing with like I think extreme cinema often when you think of extreme you just think of the most violent things yeah 
But actually, a lot of the most quote-unquote violent films aren't necessarily extreme. Extreme is more about the themes and the ideas in it. Yeah. So all of the the incest plotting and stuff in this, that's what really makes it extreme rather than the violence. Because, you know, as you say, you can go to the cinema every week, outside Mm. of pandemics, obviously. You can go (laughs) to the cinema every week and see a film that's as violent, if not more violent, than, than Old Boy. But it's the the thematic violence of it, the yeah. the darkness of it, the extremity of it, the the uncompromising feel of it. There are times where it, it does that thing that all of the best dark films do, where you think you've seen more than you have. So, yeah. For example, um, if you ask someone about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they'll go, "Oh, that's one of the most violent films I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, it's horrifying." But you don't see very much at all in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When Toby Hooper made it, he was pursuing a PG certificate yeah. because it was so non-explicit. Um, obviously, ratings bodies thought differently <laughs> um, and still do. But you, the actual visual violence, you think you've seen more than you have. Yeah. And I think there are elements of that in, in, in Old Boy. Certainly the, the tongue scene, you see a lot less of it than you think you do. Yeah, yeah, it is. And if it's there you just see the scissors rather than the actual yeah. like cutting off itself it's yeah exactly what you said it's it always reminds me of uh like stuff like science of lambs which is the hannibal lecter movie when he's like barely on screen and you know it's, it's about something more than you know like hannibal it's about something more than like physical violence it's what you said it's the themes itself and it's it makes me laugh because i thought like you couldn't get more messed up than some hollywood movies like seven about a sort old boy <laughs> <laughs> never the well, same that's it. Sense. I think if you're, yeah, if you're sort of like, you know, your kind of your formative years of being a film fan, and for a lot of us, it's like our our teenage years where we're we're a bit more independent, so we're able to get hold of weird little stuff. Yeah. Certainly, you know, this was coming around at the the, the peak time of like uh, of the internet being a way of discovering stuff. Yeah, two thousand and three, um, it was. Yeah, and so like you know forums and message boards and stuff everyone's talking about something like old boy and if you see someone saying oh this is the sickest film i've ever seen 15 year old you is gonna go yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm finding that and i'm watching that yeah uh go on then what's your... certainly what i was like <laughs> yeah I was, gonna, I was just gonna ask you what's your favorite scene ben if you had to pick one scene one scene well the scene i enjoyed most this time was the ant on the subway oh surreal <laughs> i just thought it was so wild I thought it was so wild. I'd forgotten it was there because you know there are there are scenes that you're always going to remember, like the corridor scene. You'll always remember yeah. the um, the uh, the scene where it's all revealed what happened. You always remember that the teeth scene, you, the tongue scene. You'll always remember. But I had completely forgotten that there's a weird sequence with no subsequent context about <laughs> the big an ant on the subway. And yeah. yeah, I just loved it. Because I feel like it, it gets to the nub of what makes the film so brilliant is that it's never what you think it is. Mm, that's exactly like, it. It is an extreme movie. It is a violent movie. It is a neo-noir thriller. It is a mystery. But it's also a strange, absurdist comedy <laughs> at times. And that's often when it's most enjoyable. Yeah, and it's definitely funnier on repeat watches because obviously yeah. I feel like you're obviously still not over the shock because it is so shocking but you sort of understand it more so you can maybe appreciate the sort of lighter moments and it's weird because the ant on the um, subway is the penguin in fight club moment which everyone always forgets there's a penguin in fight club for seemingly no reason at all and it's just like the ant in old boy but that's a great yeah that's a great moment it's yeah when... it's like there's there's um there's the scene in in monty python's life of brian there's like a spaceship oh, yeah. scene in there. and that's the one everyone forgets from that and i do as well every time i watch life of brian again i go oh yeah, that's, yeah. that happens to be fair when the ant appeared i was like wait do i remember this <laughs> yeah. like what is yeah. happening is this like a weird new cut but no it's like it's what you said though it's like it shouldn't work but it it sums up the film entirely that like one strange yeah strange moment uh well thanks for talking about old boy before we move to the final section of the podcast we have a competition how exciting tom oh that's exciting the first zavi podcast competition because we have I, i'm the only one here so do i win it by people <laughs> well we have listeners <laughs> we just forget that it exists sometimes <laughs> but um we have one copy of our gorgeous Xavier exclusive 4K Old Boy Steelbook to give away to one lucky winner. So all they have to do is answer correctly the following trivia question. So be quiet, Tom, if you know the answer. 
because otherwise, you know, we can't just give you the prize. <laughs> um, so when Odesu meets Midu at a restaurant soon after his release, he asks to be given something alive to eat. So what does he eat? It's a very famous scene. So I hope that everyone knows the answer. Do you know the answer, Tom? Don't say it, but do you know it? I do. <laughs> okay. So when Odesu meets Mido at a restaurant soon after his release, he asks to be given something alive to eat. And what does she give him to eat? So if you know the answer, head to our website, Zavi.com, and click on the podcast page on the blog. On the article, there'll be an, uh, on the article on the page, there'll be an article about this episode. And just basically fill in the answer in the form, enter your email in, and I will pick a winner in two weeks since this podcast goes live. I'll make sure to link it as well in the description. Uh, also, uh, all the terms and conditions will be on the article. And for an extra entry, head to our Instagram page, which is at Zavi UK. Find the posts about this podcast on the main feed and comment with our hashtag video rewind and I'll look out for those and you can have an extra entry. Have you seen the uh, 4k steelbook that we've got? It's really pretty. It's um, it's Odesu with those really cool glasses on that I really want now. Because <laughs> <laughs> the fashion in this movie is so weird but I want it all. <laughs> Deeply strange. Deeply strange. <laughs> <laughs> so as we mentioned earlier, you know, Old Boy recently received a new 4K release from our friends at Arrow Video. Like Arrow Video is so good at really giving these movies, you know, such beautiful, beautiful releases. Um, and every year, you know, films are remastered and restored, and that's sort of what this podcast is about, sort of celebrating that. Whether it's a new edit, um, like there was a Godfather Coda last year, Apocalypse Now, Final Cut, or obviously 4K restorations are happening every year, but you know, I sort of wanted to ask you, Tom, about you. Know, why do you think it's important to restore and remaster movies such as Old Boy? Well, the thing, like I so said, I love the work Arrow does. Um, of the shelves behind me are many, many Arrow releases. Yeah, I can see. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think they do fabulous. The thing I like about Arrow is they often come with a reversible sleeve. Oh yes, yeah. Which is really can... good if you're nerdy like me, because you get the new artwork and the classic artwork. Yeah, yeah. So you have the brilliant new artwork, and then, for example, I've got a copy of the Driller Killer, and if you've got <gasps> the Driller Killer, you want the ridiculous <laughs> video box art of the drill, and that's there as well as the the new yeah. commission stuff. So I love all of that that Arrow does, and, and I think that. So I love physical media. I always want to own my films physically, and at a time when new physical releases aren't always the greatest sometimes they're amazing but they're not always great the restorations the the love that they put into them and the the level of extra stuff you get you get the Mm. new video essays and special features and making ofs and appreciations and all of that stuff is just wonderful um not to mention you get to see these films in in amazing quality and often sometimes they're in the way the director intended for the first time since they were originally screened so i I love that stuff i I think it's it's so important and particularly at a time when because you can never rely on a streaming service sometimes streaming services have great stuff on them but you'll go to look the next week and because of rights or because of refreshing (laughs) it's gone Mm. whereas i know that i've always got old boy (laughs) for as long as i have that disc I can always do what I did last night and I can go, I want to watch Old Boy. Yeah. And I can experience its insanity in in great quality. I know it's not going to buffer. I know it's <laughs> not going <laughs> to just stop halfway through. I know the sound's right, the picture's right, and I know I'm getting exactly what I, I remember of the film, plus the ant scene that I always forget about. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I yes, I love it. I, I love the work that, that labels like Arrow and others like them do. Um and, and so, yeah, I'm going to continue to buy new copies of all of these films whenever yeah. they're released. So, Yeah, it's interesting what you said, because obviously, like when we talk about film restoration and the importance of physical media, a lot of the focus is, is what you said, like, can you really rely on the Internet? Like, do I want to watch a film with buffering? Like, obviously, streaming services are great, but it's what you said. Sometimes like films will just disappear from there and you know, you can't, an old DVD is like the most reliable thing. And but it's what you said. I think it's the X extra effort that's gone in to making sure these films are like presented in the highest quality with these fascinating extras like on the old boy arrow release there's a really good documentary just about old boy and with a film like old boy that's so layered and textured you know 
I could be watching documentaries and reading about it for hours on end. So I think it adds like a new level to the appreciation of the movie as well, um, which is really important for these sort of cult classics in particular, which will be like, we'll be talking about Old Boy for years. Like this yeah. Arrow release is probably the first of like, you know, there'll be others in the future um, because it's just one of those films that I think will really stand the test of time. And another thing about re-releases I think people don't realise is it helps bring new audiences to it as well and that's also yeah, important. Yeah that's, that's the next thing I was going to say that's the next thing I was going to say that, that those I've seen films I never would have seen because they've been you know re-released like in the last few years there have been loads of uh, re-releases of uh, Billy Wilder films yeah. so I've seen Billy Wilder films that I never would have got around to because they're being released on new Blu-rays um, and so that stuff is, is so important because you know we're obviously quite plugged in because this is our job and we're, we're, we're in the film world but for, for people who, you know, the, the first they might see of a film is when they're wandering through a shop or browsing an online store or something like that. It might be the first they hear of a film like this mm. and they see, you know, an eye-catching, brilliant bit of art like yeah. Obey Sue in his glasses and they go, so cool. I need to get hold of that. That film looks ace. And then they'll watch it and they'll go, why is there an ant on the subway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And isn't that his daughter? What's happening? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, one last question for you, which I think is the most controversial question yet, which is how do you organise your DVD shelf? Because everyone. Oh, it's easy for me. It's oh, really? Easy for me. It's I always see this conversation. Yes, that is the right answer. Well, for me, it's the right <laughs> answer because I always see this conversation come up on Twitter, and people are like, "Is it by director?" Some crazy, crazy kids out there do it by like the colour of the sleeve, so they have like all their blue and then purple and. But I'm glad you do alphabetical because that satisfies I mean, me. Because I do mine the alphabetical. Thing, okay. The colour thing does it look satisfying? It does look satisfying. Like but it. how will I be able <laughs> to find a film? <laughs> like... Yeah. No, I have I have a separate shelf for box sets, but they're also Ooh. alphabetical on that shelf. Okay. And then everything else is yeah alphabetical. There are some minor exceptions when it's like franchises, but they're only minor exceptions. Like for example, all of the Planet of the Apes films are separately filed on there. Yeah, because yeah. you've got Rise, Dawn, and War for the Planet of the Apes, and they're all separate. <laughs> so, yeah, it's but like the thing is, go on. if they're all alphabetical, you know where they all are. Exactly, and I'm the same. I do mine alphabetical, but also it is like Alien, for instance. I have all the Alien films together, but then it annoys me because Prometheus has to sit in there. But obviously, that's <laughs> like a P amongst the A's, and oh, it's just. But it works. It's um, yeah. Have you? Have you, you see? S- I have that, that. That problem is automatically solved for me because I have all of the original aliens in a box set. Oh, and, and then, then Prometheus separately. So that's fine. <laughs> but why? But Prometheus should be with the alien films. That's what I do because it it's part the of the same fan. <laughs> it's part of the same franchise. See again. This is what I mean. Talking about organizing DVD shelves just gets people into arguments. Well, because well, the other one is the James Bond films. Where do you file the James Bond? Oh, but films? I've got a really nice Bond box set, so it's just. Well, I've I have as well, but Ooh. it covers the the it's the fiftieth anniversary set. Oh yeah. So it's, so it's everything from uh, from Doctor No to Skyfall, but then I've got Spectre just randomly in my shelf ah. un- under S, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then when No Time to Die comes out, where does that go? That's actually do you know, that's a really good point because I've got the most recent box set, so I've got Spectre in there. But yeah, what what I do when No Time to Die comes out, probably <laughs> have a meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, buy, buy a new box set <laughs> buy a new box set exactly just give me another release please come on come on Bond um, I, yeah, I thought that'd be a fun question to end on I'm going to ask every guest on this podcast how they organise their shelves and I bet you we will get a different answer from some of them like I, I would bet money on it because it's yeah. just such it's such a source of debate <laughs> yeah some people just want to watch the world burn yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for joining me, Tom. If people want to follow you on social media and see more of your work, where can they do that? Well, they can do all of that via my Twitter account, which is at Tom J Beasley, B-E-A-S-L-E-Y. All of my work, um, well, most of it is, is posted there. Oh, and you have a podcast yourself. You have several, I think. Oh, You're I the do. most po- <laughs> podcast extraordinaire I've met. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I think I've sort of pivoted in the last year from hosting my own to mostly being on other people, which is so much nicer, <laughs> can I just say? I love it. Um, but yes, I do host um, a, a podcast called Everything From Nothing, the Waterloo Road podcast, 
where um, I, a Waterloo, a Waterloo Road fan, and my friend, a Waterloo Road newbie, go through every single episode of the BBC classroom drama from the <laughs> noughties and uh, try to unpick its, its crazy, crazy storytelling. Yeah. So yes, that's available, I guess, everywhere where podcasts are. You say crazy storytelling, it's not an old boy levels, I presume. <laughs> well, no, not quite. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> I mean, we're only we're only in series four. There's still plenty oh, of time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, once again, thanks for joining us, Tom. It was great to chat about all things old boy. We'd love to hear our listeners' thoughts on both the film and the podcast, so please share them with us on our social media pages. Just use the hashtag Video Rewind. On Twitter, we are at Zavi. On Facebook, we are at Zavi Online. And over on Instagram, you can find us at Zavi UK. We also upload our podcast to YouTube in video form. So if you want to check that out, our channel is at Zavi Online. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on the platform of your choice so that you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a rating or review too. And if there's a film you'd like us to discuss on an upcoming show, just let us know on social media once again using the podcast hashtag Video Rewind. And thanks for listening. This was Zavi's Video Rewind episode on The Brilliant Old Boy and I'll see you in the next one. (laughs) 